This is Dr. Mubin Sayed from FLCCC. Today we will continue our discussion about long COVID. There is a beautiful article written and titled COVID-19 and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Endocrine Perspective. Now keep in mind that chronic fatigue syndrome that is related to long COVID especially has many pathophysiologies and we will discuss them as many as are revealed so far one by one. Today is the first one in this series. So keep your mind open that there are going to be other possibilities as well and we will discuss them. Now just for the introduction, we are from the FLCCC Alliance platform. Here is their homepage. Over here you have a lots of information about acute COVID and about long COVID. So if you scroll down a little bit, here you would see long story short with Dr. Bean and if you click here, this is where all the previous videos can be found as well. And if you go to about, you can see the physicians who are involved in production of this content and other advocacies that go on from the FLCCC's platform. So with this, let's look at this article. And before we go there, I wanted to make sure that we can look at some of the signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency or suprarenal gland and I would explain that suprarenal gland and if that gland is not working correctly that would be called adrenal insufficiency. So just a few background symptoms in our mind. Weakness, fatigue, dizziness, dark skin especially with the Edison and Edison is a type of insufficiency. Bluish black color around the nipples, mouth, rectum, scrotum or vagina again mostly in the Edison's, weight loss, fluid loss, dehydration, which could actually then cause tachycardia, lack of appetite, muscle aches, upset stomach, vomiting, diarrhea, low blood pressure, low sugar levels, in women, irregular or no menstrual periods. And I wanted to also comment here, when we say upset stomach, vomiting, diarrhea, this sometimes become rolled or confused into thinking that these are COVID related symptoms and authors discuss that in their article that sometimes this set of symptoms because COVID causes them as well. These set of symptoms do not alert the physician to try to figure out maybe there is a hormonal disruption going on as well. So again if you are a provider, if you are a clinician, please keep in mind that if you are seeing these symptoms then it may be necessary, it may be important to look at the hormonal profiles too. So then let's go back to this discussion. I'll give you a context in the beginning. What these authors did was they collected various kind of studies on hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, suprarenal gland, their disruption and they provided both sides of the study. There are some studies that say there is no effect to these glands and there are some studies that show there is effect. Then there are some studies that talk about SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV and their infection causing disruption of the endocrine and by uh, association it is possible that SARS-CoV-2 which is a cousin of these viruses could also be doing the same. So that is the way they have packaged this information beautifully written. I loved it. Let's start our discussion now with my diagrams. So here the factors that play into long COVID are many and the information continues to evolve. However, some factors that these authors put together are the following. Number one, they feel that some studies may say that there is a possibility of persistent virus. Now, if somebody is not immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, then it is less clear or less observed that the virus is persisting in people. There are immunocompromised, for example, uncontrolled HIV or immunosuppressed. They may have viral presence for a long number of days. I had presented a case from South Africa in which a woman who had HIV therapy failed, she had SARS-CoV-2 in her for 250 days or more. So this may be one possibility. The other possibility is the cytokine storm and then dysregulation of the immune system. Another possibility for long COVID symptoms is, and that is the topic for today, is the hormone system dysregulation 
So that includes hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, suprarenal glands, even ovary and testis as well. Then in some patients, there are genetic predispositions. For example, patients who are allergic, they have a tendency or the patients who have autoimmune disorders, they have a tendency to develop long COVID as well. This is why long COVID is most observed in women or women have a higher incidence and prevalence of long COVID compared to men and women have higher prevalence of autoimmune diseases in them as well. So genetic and epigenetic factors, even microbiome and we will do a discussion about microbiome as well. Immune dysregulation and autoimmunity as we discussed before, then the organ damage. Of course it is possible that in some patients who may have severe outcomes, their organs may be damaged and so there may be kidney damage, heart damage, lung damage and there may be signs and symptoms of the tissue damage and then tissue fibrosis that might actually cause signs and symptoms of various diseases in the long run. Now at FLCCC and with my teachings I usually use the long COVID as signs and symptoms that persist after the expected duration of the acute phase to be over, usually four weeks and after. And it is possible that there is a continuity of the symptoms beyond four weeks or there is a recovery, patient feels better, the symptoms go away and then a few weeks later, a new set of symptoms start, which is not explained by other diagnosis and that becomes long COVID. So here in this article, Authors have divided the long COVID into two definitions. One, they say that continuity of the acute COVID symptoms. So somebody got ill today and now they have the symptoms. And from the onset beyond four weeks, if they just continue to have the symptoms, then the authors are calling that this is long COVID. On the other hand, if the patient develops COVID, becomes okay, and then 12 weeks later, or by that time, that may be 8 weeks later, 9 weeks later, 10 weeks later, but at the 12 weeks time and after, the patient has developed the symptoms of long COVID or some symptoms that are not explainable by other diagnosis, then that is also called long COVID, but here they call it post-acute COVID syndrome. And here they say that according to their definition or the definition that National Institute had adapted, according to that definition, this long COVID may be a continuity of the acute symptoms or the patient may recover and then develop the symptoms again that are not explainable. So for our purposes, I'm just going to call this all long COVID. Then another refresher for us, which I discussed in the previous discussions, and that was from the UK ONS, the Office of National Statistics Department, so far in UK, the prevalence of long COVID is 2.7% of the population. I did the math and it comes to be about 8 to 10% of the COVID cases. So that's a huge number that we would be facing and we are facing. And this really causes people's lives to be disrupted in so many ways that it's a problem. Now the endocrine connection, how do they connect this all in this article? First thing that they talk about is that the ACE2 receptors or enzyme is present in many tissues and we knew this at the highest density in the kidneys, then gastrointestinal tract, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, brain, blood vessels and here they are also talking about the endocrine system. So hypothalamus, pituitary, pineal gland, thyroid, parathyroid, memory glands, suprarenal glands, the glands that are present on top of the kidneys, pancreas, ovary, testis, these all also have ACE2 enzymes in them. That means the virus can affect them. That also means if the vaccine or the spike is going to target an ACE2, then that target can be on these tissues as well. The reference that they showed, and I really loved it, there is this site called proteinatlas.org. Here, you can actually see various proteins of our body and where are they found. So here, if you see, this is ACE2 
and various properties of ACE2. But then if you scroll down, these are the tissues where ACE2 is present and the expression score of how much ACE2 is present. That is what they are showing over here. So look at this kidney and urinary bladder, female tissues, muscles. Look at this GIT, respiratory system, liver and gallbladder and so on, pancreas. So it is actually worthwhile to give it a look. It's actually lots of fun to see where these ACE proteins or the RNA expressions are present. So going back here, because ACE2s are present on the glands, glands could become direct target of SARS-CoV-2. That doesn't mean that that is the only way pathology can occur. It is possible that the antibodies that are produced, they can go and attack the endocrines. It is also possible that the cytotoxic tells cells that have become produced as part of the immune dysregulation, they might attack it. It is also possible that the inflammatory molecules that are now circulating in the body, these molecules can go and attack these. There may be a combination of all of these and there may be more reasons. So it is not just the presence of ACE2, but ACE2 is also an important factor. So then authors have curated a few studies in which they are connecting the dots for us. So first of all, they talk about a few studies in the patients of severe COVID who have died and their post-mortems are done. So they say that in the post-mortem studies, we have seen that SARS-CoV-2 was found in pituitary, parathyroids, adrenal glands or suprarenal glands. So when I say adrenal or suprarenal, they are the same things. They are the glands that are present on top or they sit on top of the kidneys, pancreas, and even testis as well. Although the post-mortem data should be carefully used because this is the data from patients who had such severe outcome of the disease and the cytokine storms that they died. And while they are going through the respiratory distress and the sepsis and the tissue breakdown, SARS-CoV-2 that is present almost everywhere now in these patients could end up in many tissues where it will not be able to go in regular healthy individuals. So just keep that in mind. So this is one set of studies. Then they talk about another study where this is not a post-mortem study, this is actually in the healthy individuals, where they found that the thyroid, thyroid cells, so if you see here this little diagram, you see some spheres here. These are called the thyroid follicles. In the center, there is a sphere which I have cut in half, so you can kind of look inside of this as well. So here. So these are called the thyroid follicles, and then around the follicles are the other cells that are called parafollicular cells, or around the follicle cells. What they found was the patients of SARS-CoV-2 infection had apoptosis going on in the follicular and parafollicular cells. So in general, I can say almost all cells of the thyroid had apoptosis happening in them. Apoptosis mean dying of a cell. A cell thinks that I am under enough stress that I cannot function correctly anymore and the cell initiates a suicide or apoptosis. It is also possible that the inflammatory system cells arrive to another cell and they sense this other cell's health and they tell the cell to kill itself because it does not seem healthy. Maybe it is infected by the virus or maybe it is cancerous and so on. So the signs of or presence of apoptosis means this tissue is under stress and under attack. So either it decided to kill itself by itself or immune system told it to kill these cells. So that is another important finding that endocrine system is involved when the infection occurs. And these kind of dysregulations can continue beyond the acute infection. Now, how long will we recover? That is still a question, but some of these studies are showing the damage even after a year. Then in another study, so again, all of these studies are uh, referenced in the article. In another study, the authors mentioned that this study shows damage to the zona fasciculata of suprarenal glands. So what does this mean? So first of all, what is a suprarenal gland? 
So these are the glands. There are two glands present sitting on top of each kidney. I used to visualize these as little caps that kidneys are wearing. These are called adrenal glands or suprarenal glands. And as less important they may sound, these are critical glands for our normal operations. They help us keep the sodium and potassium balance. They help us keep water or fluid volume balance. They produce estrogens and other sex hormones. They produce steroids that are hugely important. And we are talking about steroid disruption today. They produce adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, without which we cannot really function correctly. So these and en- these endocrine glands, if they get disrupted, we develop quite a miserable life. And some signs of those, depending upon what part of the gland. So let's go to this part. First, before I go to signs and symptoms, this gland, if you cut it and you see from outside inwards, the outer part is called cortex and inner part, this blue part I made here, is called medulla. We are going to talk about medulla and the hormones from there and the myocarditis in the long COVID in the next discussion. Today, we are talking more about the cortex and within the cortex, there are three layers. The outermost layer of the cortex is called zona glomerulosa. And I remember it by GFR. GFR, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. In our medical schools, we used to remember it as the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. Why the glomerulosa and its function is related to mineralocorticoid balance, that is sodium, water, potassium balance, so salt. Zona fasciculata, the second layer, which we are talking about today, that produces glucocorticoids, so sweeter than salt and steroids. Zona reticularis, the innermost layer of the cortex, that produces androgens and the estrogen or the sex hormones, and that becomes even sweeter. So according to one more study, 39% of the COVID patients, it was a small study, I think it was 62 patients or so, 39% of them, after one year, still had dysregulation of the zona fasciculata, or they still had abnormal or low cortisol levels. 39% of the patients. So you could say that 40% of the, according to this study, if you take that data, 40% of the COVID cases may have fatigue and lethargy and dizziness and the tachycardias and the fluid imbalances as we saw before or some form of them, even after a year. And guess what? If doctor is not suspecting that this may be a hormonal imbalance, they may be looking at GIT issues, they may be looking at autonomic issues, they may be looking at the heart itself. And so we all, if not focusing on the correct thing, may be lost. So this is why it is important to keep this in mind. And then there is medulla and other parts that are not important. We are today in this topic, discussing fasciculata and the cortisols. Now we come to the second part of the discussion today. And this is what happens, what kind of disruption in the endocrine system is observed. So first one, HPA axis disruption. What is that? Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland axis. Why do we call it an axis? So what happens is, this is hypothalamus. It is sitting somewhere over here, right behind the optic chiasm and above the pituitary. Hypothalamus is sometimes called the master gland or the master switchboard for the endocrine system's control. Hypothalamus usually, in most cases, sends its orders to pituitary. Then pituitary, in turn, helps the remaining glands or endocrine system to modulate itself, to increase or decrease its function. Some literature says that hypothalamus and pituitary together make the complex that controls the remaining endocrine system. So whichever way you want to see it, just know that hypothalamus plays an important controlling role, then pituitary, that plays an, another part controlling role, And then the other glands that are sitting in the body are then working under the influence and control of these two. 
So of course, then every gland is going to have something to do with these two guys, the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. So HPA axis mean order from hypothalamus to anterior pituitary, P, and then from there, the orders to suprarenal glands or adrenal glands. That makes HPA axis. As the hormones are released, and I'll explain those in a second, then there is a negative feedback as well. So these two glands or controllers, hypothalamus and anterior pituitary, when they send an order, for example, to adrenal to say release cortisol or steroids, and the adrenal says, okay, I will release steroids, then hypothalamus and pituitary can actually see or measure in the blood how much steroids are present, and then they can decide to reduce their signal to adrenal and reduce the production of cortisol. So this is a negative feedback mechanism. The point is, these two controlling agents are continuously modulating the cortisol's levels and other hormones' levels. So now there is a disruption of this axis. So what happens is hypothalamus normally releases, so in terms of HPA axis, hypothalamus releases corticotropin-releasing hormone or CRH. That hormone from hypothalamus is a message to anterior pituitary to say, ask the adrenal gland to work. So anterior pituitary says, okay, fine, I will ask it. And anterior pituitary releases in response to CRH, it releases ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. This ACTH gets in the blood and from there it reaches the suprarenal glands. Suprarenal gland, when it receives ACTH orders, then it starts releasing cortisol and then cortisol does negative feedback. In one of the studies, so now going back to the author's work, in one of the studies, they found in recovered patient, recovered patient, they're thinking, hey, we're all good. Even a year after, there was low level of cortisols present in them. So they had chronic ACTH deficiency. So it was not that their suprarenals were not working. Their anterior pituitary was not working. And I remember there was a discussion I did with FLCCC's physician, Dr. Keith Berkowitz, where we were suspecting that it is possible that due to the inflammation in the brain, pituitary sits in a bony structure called cella tertica, which is a hard structure around pituitary. And so pituitary does not have enough of a chance to swell. It would become impacted by the bone around it. And that can cause either temporary damage and dysregulation or permanent damage depends upon how much swelling needed to occur and how much impact the bone made on it. And the result of that is that the whole body's endocrine system can become disrupted and a major disruption is to the suprarenal glands, which then in turn has fluid imbalance and tachycardias and so on. So here you're seeing a study that is almost providing the similar line of thought here or observation. So what they're saying is a year after, cortisol levels are still down but they are down not because suprarenal are damaged, but down because anterior pituitary is not releasing ACTH correctly. Now, is that because hypothalamus is not asking it to do that or it itself is damaged? This study thought or observed that it was ACTH level from the pituitary, the remaining hormone CRH were fine. Now, in terms of pathology, this will be called secondary adrenal deficiency. What does that mean? If there is a damage to the suprarenal gland itself and it is not able to produce hormones, then we call it primary adrenal insufficiency because the primary tissue itself is not working. Secondary insufficiency is that when the tissue that is sending suprarenal glands, the orders to work, which is anterior pituitary, which sends ACTH, if anterior pituitary is not functioning correctly, then suprarenal can actually make the hormones, but they're not getting the orders. That is called secondary insufficiency because it's a secondary tissue, another tissue that is not functioning correctly. If hypothalamus does not send the orders to anterior pituitary correctly, in turn, anterior pituitary is not sending messages to suprarenal, then that would be called a tertiary adrenal deficiency because this is the third tissue that is not sending the orders or third level tissue. Anyways, this study found secondary adrenal insufficiency even after a year in recovered patients. So imagine these patients, they are recovered. They thought COVID is over a year ago. 
and they still have fatigues and dizziness weight loss git symptoms and they i'm sure that they are still either figuring out what was going on or they were or their doctors would be scratching their head that what is happening and i'm sure that there are some excellent doctors that would have found it the point is there can be a confusion and we have to be able to connect these dots then another study which i thought was fascinating another study in the similar context explained another thing which is very very interesting they said so now we're talking about what is the cause of all of this why is hpa axis not working correctly so before i go to the study let me just explain this the study is that the authors connected or referred plus the author's own thought is it is possible that there is hypophysitis hypophysitis means inflammation of hypothalamus and we have done this discussion that why maybe as2 and so the sars cov2 maybe inflammatory molecules maybe disruption of the immune system cells and they causing this so there could be many reasons maybe just the inflammation in the brain in general causing compressions or maybe blood clotting so many possibilities but eventually there is hypophysitis or there could be hypothalamic damage by cytopathologies that is couple of reasons then this is another interesting study that they connected or referred they said in one of the studies it is observed that the amino acids expressed by sars cov2 amino acids are what amino acids are the bricks that make up proteins so if you see here the proteins i have proteins you have proteins these proteins are made of small unit bricks or molecules these are called amino acids amino acids sit down together in various patterns to make bigger substances which are called proteins so of course sars cov2 has proteins as well spike protein is an example of proteins so they are saying that there are the proteins in sars cov2 have amino acid patterns that are very similar to acth pattern adrenocorticotropic hormone pattern that comes from anterior pituitary released from there and influences the adrenal now if sars cov2 has a molecular pattern that is similar to acth then what will happen is that when our immune system will respond to sars cov2 and produce antibodies to its various amino acid patterns called epitopes then we might end up making antibodies against acth because of molecular mimicry this similarity between two things one the foreign material or antigen and one our own body's tissue is called molecular mimicry this molecular mimicry could then cause an autoimmune outcome where our immune system is now making antibodies against the sars cov2 but these antibodies can bind with acth as well so maybe pituitary is actually producing acth but before that acth goes to suprarenal and delivers the message on the way the antibodies bind with it and make it useless so the tissues are all fine they actually think they are working but the immune system is wiping out the acth release or reducing the number of molecules so this is another study i thought this was a fascinating study and now just a general concept that steroid use itself can become a reason for adrenal insufficiency when steroids are withdrawn especially abruptly so what happens is when somebody is given and the authors say that during this sars cov2 pandemic steroids were given at large scales to patients who were becoming severe so imagine when somebody is given steroids either chronically or in large amounts in hospitals if so when, when the steroids are given what happens is if you keep an eye on this axis usually the suprarenal gland is supposed to make steroids but we are giving steroid from outside the result of that is the suprarenal gland and this whole axis says you know what we have ample steroid let's not make more so as the whole axis reduces its function the suprarenal gland also loses the cells that make cortisol so zona fasciculata cells become less in number now if all of a sudden steroids are withdrawn or if patient decides to just stop them by themselves then what happens is there is a demand for steroid yesterday there were steroids today there are none because nothing is coming from outside so the body says to the suprarenal gland and the hpa axis to say i need more steroids 
the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary say fine we will help you have more steroid and so they would increase the crh and acth levels and when the acth goes to the suprarenal gland and says you must produce steroid there are not enough cells there are not enough workers to produce steroid and under that stress the suprarenal gland tries to function as much as it can while it is trying to produce new cells as well that stress can actually cause bleeding and insufficiency and suprarenal glands can become damaged so authors are postulating that in some patients this may be the reason for suprarenal gland abrupt stoppage of steroids which would then in turn lead to chronic fatigue and dizziness and all those symptoms i talked about before then authors so after the hpa they focus a little more on the adrenal gland and they cite some more studies so they talk about some post mortem case reports in which they say that we observed or the people who did the post mortem they observed microscopic adrenal lesions they observed hemorrhages or bleeding within the suprarenal glands or adrenal glands they observed adrenal infarctions just like we develop heart attacks and we have a part of the tissue dying similarly suprarenal gland may die or parts of it may die and these are infarctions that can lead to primary adrenal insufficiency so in the discussion above we saw secondary insufficiency where hypothalamus and anterior pituitary were not functioning correctly or maybe acth on the way was getting uh, you know attacked by the immune system here the suprarenal gland itself is damaged and this damage and the lack of its function will be called primary adrenal insufficiency that means in long covid if you are a clinician in long covid primary adrenal insufficiency is possible secondary adrenal insufficiency is possible tertiary adrenal insufficiency is possible and a combination of all of these is possible now researchers are awesome that they have given opposing studies as well for almost all of the discussion we did they have given studies where they said this study was done and the researchers found no issues with the endocrine so that means it's not necessary that everybody who has covid will have endocrine problem it is also not necessary that everybody who has fatigue for sure has adrenal outcomes or adrenal reasons then they have a couple of more postulations one around thyroid they don't have larger studies referred but they have some case reports so they said they cited three case reports in one of the case reports after the covid the patient developed hashimotos so that is an autoimmune dysregulation attacking thyroid now or involving thyroid in another case they saw an autoimmune hyperthyroidism or hyperparathyroidism after covid in another case they saw autoimmune hyperparathyroidism in a patient who had graves disease and had become was in remission and now they developed autoimmune outcomes again and finally the researchers didn't have a lot of studies around pancreas but they postulated that because pancreas is a target because of as2 presence secondly during the stress there is a stress on pancreas as well to produce more insulin thirdly if the inflammation and the immune dysregulation and autoimmunity occurs and attacks the pancreas then it is possible that the pancreas would get involved as well in the previous studies for example with SARS-CoV-1 people who had SARS-CoV-1 they developed diabetes 10 years earlier than their age mates so that was an indication that SARS-CoV-1 had caused damage to the pancreas and what happens is during our aging process pancreas slowly continues to lose its insulin making cells and when that amount of cells is significantly lost then pancreas cannot keep up the remaining part of the pancreas cannot keep up to provide enough insulin and we develop diabetes but if there is an infection that takes out a part of the pancreas we may or these cells that make insulin the beta cells we may not understand at right at that time because the remaining cells are still in good enough quantity to continue to support us but when the cells continue to burn out what we say clinical horizon clinical horizon is the time when a disease becomes apparent the clinical horizon for diabetes might be pulled earlier so these are the 
various possibilities of the immune dysregulation that can become chronic and can cause long COVID symptoms. And it is not necessary that everybody with these symptoms must have these, but this is an important area to work up when you as a clinician are doing the workups for your patient. Thank you very much and I'll see you again.